Okay, so let's uh, let's begin our session. Um, uh, welcome, welcome to our webinar titled "Stakeholder Relationship Management for Natural Resource Companies: Strategi Strategies to Minimize Risks and Improve Project Outcomes." As we mentioned in our webinar, as a result, companies face increased risk of community opposition, costly issue resolution, and delayed or denied project approvals. So to get wider buy-in from governments investors, community stakeholders, these organizations need to focus more today on building trust and social capital. And a key element to achieving these goals is stakeholder relationship management. The problem is that many stakeholder management initiatives are not very efficient and fail to provide the critical insights necessary to maximize stakeholder support throughout all stages of a project. I'm assuming that these are concerns that resonate with you, which is why you've decided to join our session today. So let's begin by introducing uh, today's speakers. My name is Greg Nutter, and I'm Simply Stakeholders Head of Global Sales. Joining me is Allison Hendricks, who is not only the company's founder and CEO, but our resident expert on stakeholder relationship management. Allison, can you share a little bit about your background and your experience with stakeholder relationship management? Hi, everybody, and hello, Greg. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been working in stakeholder engagement for a long time, um, initially as a consultant advising government and various companies, and really um, out of my own sense of frustration of needing better ways to manage the feedback and get some real insights from it is what sort of led me down this path of um, starting this company. And um, over the years, since we've been working with Darzen and Simply Stakeholders, we've worked with a lot of mining companies, um, natural resources companies um, right across the world. So lots of insights um, and, you know, we've had the privilege of seeing how um, companies operate in these sectors um, in different regions. And um, ship management or SRM. So we're all on the same page. From there, we'll drill down a bit on how SRM is used in the natural resources industry and talk a bit about some of the key challenges that companies face in implementing it. Then we'll have Allison uh, share some real life examples of natural resources organizations who have faced stakeholder challenges and how they leveraged stakeholder relationship management solutions to address them. Finally, we share some best practices on how to effectively set up an SRM solution and wrap up with a Q&A session where we encourage you to ask uh, Allison any questions you have regarding how to make SRM work best for you. Um, to do this, we'll use the chat Q&A feature uh, in your uh, screen there. So feel free to enter your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll do our best to get to all of them at the end. During our presentation, we'll also be conducting a few interactive polls to get your input uh, on thoughts regarding stakeholder relationship management. So let's begin. Um, so what are the key trends we're seeing in the natural resources industry? There are many, and the people on this call probably know them much better than we do, but let's quickly review the big five that we often hear about. First, uh, we're all aware of the need for organizations to transition to more sustainable approaches through adoption of new methods and technologies. However, these transitions take time and cost money. At the same time, it's also important to recognize that the mining industry provides the raw materials for an expanding list of green technologies, without which the transition to low, lower carbon energy sources will take much longer. Also, the scope of sustainable development today goes well beyond just the environment includes addressing economic and social impacts as well. Next, we are seeing, and now today it's less than $85. We're seeing similar swings in the, in, with minerals, such as gold, copper, and lithium. For example, gold hit a high earlier this year of $2,000, and it's declined about 30% in the last few months. There are also greater regulatory uncertainty. As governments try to respond to growing pressures to address climate concerns. Last month, as many of you know, California regulators passed rules banning the sale of new gas powered cars by 2035. While at the same time, California and some European countries extended the life of several nuclear power plants. So new taxes, laws, policies, and other government interventions are certainly to be expected. All of these factors lead to investment constraints. External investors are hesitant and sometimes limited 
in their ability to invest in companies whose activities conflict with their newly established ESG guidelines. At the same time, resource companies themselves are becoming increasingly cautious around new product investment, particularly large ones, which won't start generating profits for years or even decades. Finally, there we go. Finally, um, while there are always some degree of external stakeholder influence on the industry, the level of activity is growing rapidly. Um, not long ago, the consultancy ERM wrote an article entitled, Prepare for a Super Cycle in Anti-Mining Activism. Their opinion is that much of this is being driven by global societal anxieties, which are finding expression in an anti-natural resource campaigns. Certainly a challenging environment indeed. Allison, which of these trends do you think is having the greatest impact on the natural resources industry? I think a couple of things are at play here. You know, the, um, the increasing focus on um, the social performance and the environmental performance of the natural in, um, resources industry has meant um, um, along the compliance lines, so especially with the E and the G elements, the S, you know, the social component wasn't given as much um, prevalence, if you like, uh, but we're increasingly seeing um, companies very proactively looking at you know, how can we overcome the social trust deficit um, by, by using our, you know, ESG programs for it? And I think combined with that as well, um, we're seeing a lot of mining companies um, investing in um, sustainability projects. They're some of the biggest investors in sustainability. So I think that goes to towards that um, trend of looking to, you know, how can we not only sort of improve our existing operations, but... Um, how can we, what role do we play in this new um, sustainability sort of economy, particularly in, in relation to sort of rare minerals and, um, you know, supply chain issues. Yeah, so so I think some interesting things coming out of it. It's not all bad news. It, it, you know, it's um, turning from um, something we need to be afraid of and comply with, but if we get things wrong to how can we create some strategic um, competitive advantage out of this. Okay, great. Thanks, Allison. So let's now turn our attention to the core of today's webinar and begin with a question. What exactly is stakeholder relationship management? Um, some people think it's a form of CRM or customer relationship management or contact management, but it's really quite different. Um, companies that confuse the two often end up in a situation where they do where one does well and the other does quite poorly. Um, but before we share our definition of stakeholder relationship management or SRM, I think it's important to back up a bit to answer another question. What exactly is a stakeholder? I'm gonna see if we can do something about that. Um, just while I'm waiting for you to answer. <clears throat> so stakeholders um, in a natural resource context um, are a little bit broader than some industries face. So not only do you have the traditional um, groups like government, regulators, public, um, communities that you affect, the workers, but you also have um, you know, the broader um, community, the NGOs, the um, suppliers, the um, unions, um, you know, quite a, quite a huge range of stakeholders. Um, we often tend to say, you know, your stakeholders could be anyone except for the customers, except in, you know, in mining, customers are a really important part of your stakeholder landscape as well. Great. Thanks, Alison. I, I like to define them as all the people who can either help your project or hurt your project. So a uh, wide range of people that fit into that category for sure. So here's our definition of stakeholder relationship management. First, let me start by saying that we like to think of it as a process, not a technology. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of various technologies we can use to support it, but the first and most important part is understanding the overall process itself. So that process is centered around tracking, organizing, and analyzing stakeholder interactions in order to and minimize a project's risk or to prove it, improve its outcome. And it involves the following. First, identifying your key stakeholders. Who is it that can help you or hurt you, as I mentioned earlier? Then analyzing their needs, concerns, and sentiments based on your interactions with them. 
finally, planning your engagement activities to address any risks or leverage any opportunities that your analysis has shown. Allison, how difficult of a process is this for organizations to, to do or implement? I think it's a fairly structured, um, you know, really encourage you to look into that methodology if you aren't using it already. So that that helps you really get a great feel for, you know, uh, are we consulting with the right range of stakeholders and who should we be talking to? But yeah, it, it's, it's not difficult. It just requires a little bit of thought and planning out in line with the actual phases of your, your activities and your projects. Great. Thanks, Alison. Um, before we continue, let's get some input from our attendees today uh, with this poll question. So based on the previous definition we shared on what is stakeholder relationship management, how involved is your organization? So I'm going to start our poll here. And you should see the questions come up in front of you. And so tell us what your organization is doing within stakeholder relationship management. Involved not at all, a little, occasionally, regularly, extensively. Give it another 30 seconds or so, and then I'll publish the results. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. So hopefully you can see the results. 100% um, of our attendees today said extensively. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Alison? I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I think the um, natural resources and mining industry have often led the way with stakeholder engagement. While it's new to other industries, I think in this industry in particular, people really understand the risk of not getting it right. And um, a lot of the sort of advanced methodology and work we're seeing is coming out of this sector. So, yeah, I'm not surprised. Okay. Because of a project to try and get support and input. Uh, second is relationship management, which we see in the ongoing um, management of a project, uh, managing the sentiment and support of those stakeholders, and project communications, where you have a project that you're uh, deploying and you want to communicate and track the performance as to how the your stakeholders uh, view that. Um, we can break these down, as you see in the slide, into the following five phases for the natural resource industries. Certainly exploration and permitting, permitting is often heavily oriented around advocacy and consultation. Uh, the development and production stages or phases are often more associated with project communication and relationship management. And reclamation can be a combination of all three. So without stakeholder relationship management, natural resource companies can face the following critical challenges. Um, so Allison, with regard to natural resource companies, what do you see as the most common challenges? Oh gosh, uh, it really depends on the phase that they're in. So I think at the exploration and scoping pre-feasibility sort of um, stages, it's really critical to get to the right stakeholders. I think where um, a lot of companies um, get come unstuck is that They've not identified, um, you know, if you look at the traditional owners, for example, they might have um, invested all their time talking to one particular traditional owner group only to discover quite late in the process that it wasn't the right group or it wasn't the only group to be talking to. So I think that that sort of, um, you know, mapping out who your stakeholders are um, is, is a big challenge at the start in that pre-feasibility and feasibility stage. In the operations, it tends to be a little bit more settled because you've got your community established, you've got some relationships established with them. And then it's just really a matter of staying on top of um, issues, building trust, um, social investment becomes a really important process um, right from the scratch because it's, um, you know, yeah, the, the parameters have changed dramatically. So I think getting that right motion in place at the right time tends to be the biggest challenge um, at that sort of final um, phase of a project. So it sounds like the front end and the back end are the most 
hazardous, so to speak, uh, that companies really need to pay important attention to. And then if they do that well, then the that middle production uh, phase is a little easier. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Allison. So let's uh, do another quick poll. Um, we shared kind of uh, why natural resource companies are implementing stakeholder relationship management in the various phases. I'd like to ask you, which phases do you think are most critical uh, to you and your company? So I'm going to pull this poll up again and start it. So let us know, is it in the early permitting exploration stages, the development production stages, or the reclamation stages, which do you think are much critical? And, and certainly that can change. Um, your organization might be at a stage where um, exploration and permitting is really critical right now. Uh, you, on the other hand, you might have some fairly mature uh, operations and where you know production is much more critical. So if everyone can um, tell us what you think, and we'll give that another few seconds, and then we'll close that up. And don't be shy. <laughs> well, our attendees tend for a typical, say, mining project at the planning and approval stage. Traditionally, you're looking for a very targeted ESIA consultation. You're looking at forward planning um, with a schedule and with, you know, make sure you have adequate resources. And the key goal at this stage is to explore, um, you know, what is the kind of sentiment towards your project at the moment? What are the risks and challenges you're likely to face? <clears throat> is any, you know, opposition uh, existing or likely to develop? So um, very sensitive stage at that planning and feasibility study phase, um, but really largely focused on information gathering and risk identification. Okay. In the operations phase, you're looking at focusing your consultation efforts on the stakeholders who are most affected by the project. So that's your local communities as well as workers and you know communities that might be affected with downstream effects. The goal here is continuity and relationships, you know, continuing to um, inform, disclose, consult and report to stakeholders is really critical, making them, you know, keeping them well informed at every stage. In the construction phase, you know, this can be quite, uh, have quite um, significant impacts, direct impacts on people because you're actually, you know, construction activity. So in this phase, you're needing some rapid res um, response to grievances, good processes in place so that you can deal with issues as they emerge and in a very timely manner. And again, you want to involve your stakeholders in both um, keeping them informed of what's going on, but also in mitigating any impacts. And then in the uh, decommissioning phase, um, you know, you still need to keep your grievance mechanism operational, but you're looking at, um, again, wider consultation with the broader community to understand, um, you know, not only to let them know that um, you are committed to seeing this process through and, um, you know, um, it's, it's really critical. Great. Thanks, Alison. So it's important to note that stakeholder relationship management, there's been a lot of interest in that, and it's been increasing quite dramatically over the past few years. Here's a chart from a recent uh, McKinsey report that indicated that nearly 60% of CEOs and board directors are making stakeholder engagement a top three, three priority. I've spoken to a few uh, mining and uh, uh, natural resource organizations recently who said that their board has put that as a, a directive on their um, uh, one of the directives that they uh, they need to fulfill. What McKinsey noticed was that this increased focus by business leaders has become amid a growing of evidence that addressing societal issues and stakeholder priorities creates long-term business value. And I'm sure many of you have heard about, as 
um, Allison talked about um, the push towards ESG or environmental, social, and government investing. So certain mutual funds or other investment managers are forced to invest in companies who have a strong record in ESG. But while leaders re view responding to external stakeholder issues as a priority, the report findings also show that stakeholder engagement has remained a challenge for many organizations. Um, if you explore this issue a little further, and, and we have a poll question here, but I think because our, our attendees are being a little shy, I think we'll just talk about it. But um, it's really around the kind of technologies that organizations use to support a stakeholder relationship management. On the slide here, you, t you see f six different uh, ways to implement a, um, an SRM initiative. So rather than asking our uh, attendees, Allison, is there a typical technology evolution that you see when organizations are trying to implement stakeholder ratio management? Where do they start? Where do they progress from there? Well, the really surprising thing is that, um, you know, while this industry re is really kind of aware of the risks of needing to do stakeholder engagement and stakeholder management, and they're aware of, you know, the, the challenges, what we find is that most of these organisations, you know, big, small, medium, um, don't have great systems in place. It is, it is quite surprising. A lot are still using Excel spreadsheets or um, OneNote documents. Um, Sometimes they've tried to tack on stakeholders, but yeah, you know, when we don't often see um, companies with you know really robust systems already in place, which is kind of a paradox, right? Because this industry really understands the risk. Great, thank you. So, when poor technologies are used, uh, perhaps when or not used at all, projects suffer. Um, the stakeholder relationship management initiative suffers. And here are six key areas that we often hear about. Um, the first one being administrative overhead. We have uh, uh, people spending a lot of time replicating tasks, searching for information, trying to compile reports, figuring out who we talked to, who we didn't talk to, who else has um, been talked to. Um, we have a team with limited visibility around what's been done um, who are uh, most important stakeholders, their thoughts, uh, their sentiment, um, which is you know, poor coordination. We have a conversation with a, a stakeholder that uh, where we didn't understand that somebody else on your team just recently had one. And that kind of erodes your, not just the team effectiveness, but your credibility with your stakeholders. Um, there's low confidence in the data that you have. Um, you know, do we really understand uh, the top issues? Do we really understand the sentiment of key groups? Um, when systems are hard to capture information, we tend not to capture it. Um, Excel is a very difficult to capture, you know, the granularity of information that you need. And so a lot of people don't capture it. And so we're not sure if it's all correct. Um, I talked about the credibility issue before is when we reach out we don't know what's happened before. We don't know precisely um, the history of interacting with those stakeholders and that impacts our credibility. Uh, our ability to analyze, not just what's our over, the overall sentiment towards our project uh, or the top issues, but to do it more granularly. Which groups are really to for us? Which ones are a uh, sticky note or in some other technology? Um, and so having that locked down uh, and secure, particularly for a project that isn't just a few months, but may last years or decades, having that information available and secure for long periods of time is really critical. Anything you'd add to that, Allison, about maybe some particular areas that in uh, the natural resources industries that particularly acute I think user frustration, you know, I think the teams all have great intentions and want to do the right thing and build good relationships, but they're just kind of let down by poor systems. So that is something we see quite often that, you know, there's there's a high degree of user frustration. And another thing is, um, you know, these projects are around for a long time and the relationships uh, need to be maintained over a long time. If you don't have a good system in place, the information leaves when you have staff turnover. 
works out the door with with those people. So, you know, creating another sort of risk factor. So I think that those two I would see quite commonly. Mm. Great. Thanks, Alison. So just before we have Alison take you through uh, some industry case studies, I want to share a quick overview of our Simply Stakeholders platform. It's a cloud-based um, platform that's designed to keep all of your contact information in, in one place uh, and to support a fairly robust stakeholder relationship management uh, solution. So there are four areas that I really want to touch on briefly. First, it's cost effective and secure. Um, the uh, uh, is really quite affordable to, to, uh, based on other technologies and it's very scalable. You can start with small teams and move it up to uh, very uh, large groups and it's got enterprise grade security. As to what the sentiment is by group, what your activities are by group um, and it has some very powerful drill down uh, features. And lastly, one of the key differentiators of uh, Simply Stakeholders is it's really easy to set up and easy to use. We have people using our system within uh, a couple of weeks uh, of uh, turning on licenses. Um, their teams don't need constant training um, and it integrates with a lot of uh, existing tools that they have such as Outlook or Gmail uh, or uh, other uh, systems such as uh, survey, survey uh, engines. And one of the most important part is this system has been validated. Uh, uh, we work with hundreds of leading organizations globally. Here's a snapshot of some of the uh, organizations in the mining and natural resources industry. And they purchased uh, the system to reduce risk, to complete their projects faster, to get better outcomes, and most importantly, to enhance their reputation that builds uh, social capital. Anything you'd like to add to that, Allison? No, I think you've covered it well. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so now let's explore a few uh, real life situations where resource companies have leveraged stakeholder relationship management to their uh, benefit. Um, the first situation, and we've, uh, we're not gonna share the names of these companies because they've not authorized us to do that. And certainly if you work with us, we won't share your name either, but. Our first case study is about a resource company looking to implement a stakeholder relationship management system across a global team. Uh, Allison, tell us about this situation. So about 18 months ago, looking to, you know, um, raise the standard, if you like, introduce the standard and raise it across all of the sites. They liked Simply Stakeholders because of its ease of use, um, because user adoption was going to be really critical to success, particularly in some of um, you know, the regions they were operating in, there was there were challenges, right, in terms of literacy and um, language, of course. Um, we ended up creating, um, you know, Portuguese and Spanish and French interfaces of Simply Stakeholders, particularly for this client, to help support their global rollout. And um, it was done in a very structured way. So the teams were quite nervous about, you know, this new uh, requirement from head office. Um, you know, what What was the expectation and how were they going to meet it as well as, you know, doing their daily job. And I think, um, you know, the, the nice thing about how this process was managed was um, there was a lot of kind of support given to each of the local teams um, to help them come on board, bring their data across, train them, and, um, you know, really kind of cushion the impact uh, very well. And 12 months down the track, um, you know, all of the teams had implemented it right across the world and it had all reached a certain standard. And now for the last few months, um, the team have been looking to raise that bar a little bit. So I think, you know, the, the real learning from this is that it is possible to get consistency and, um, and you know, manage your risks and uh, implementation approach um, consistently right across global teams. Um, get that reporting up to the senior level because that's the critical thing. You know, the, the um, leadership team really needed that insight on the risks and the operations. And they managed to do that by keeping it achievable. You know, it's often um, when when there isn't a consistent standard, there's no system, you know, we have seen companies who've tried to kind of 
just dive in and, and implement a very complicated system or a complicated process. And it, you know, it's had a spectacular failure, a lot of resistance from the users. And I think one of the nice things, um, certainly the feedback we get on Simply Stakeholders is that the interface is so simple, it's easy to use. You can train a user in less than half an hour. And I think that was really important to this success. So, um, you know, we look forward to working with this team um, over the coming years to see them, you know, raise that standard. Um, it's already at a great level, but um, they have some really ambitious plans. So it's a, you know, it's a positive case study. Great. And I think being able to roll out globally is, and particularly multiple locations is really key for the natural resource industry. Um, very, very few, you know, situations where everybody's sitting in head office, everyone is in a lot of different locations that are often in, in different countries. So being able to do that quickly and easily, I think is, is really important for this, um, these kind of companies. Thanks, Alison. So, our second example involves a situation where a company suddenly had to deal with community opposition. So, Alison, what happened here? So, this is, um, you know, a, a project um, that had been ticking along for quite a while and um, generally had um, very positive and with um, a local started by one of the local ranchers in the area and um, who, you know, I think largely because um, he wanted to be bought out and wasn't going to be bought out. And so he um, he ended up, because of his connections within the community, being able to create this groundswell of community opposition. There was a lot of misinformation in the community and the company was really caught unawares. They weren't expecting this and um, they didn't have strong enough relationships themselves with the wider community to be able to counter it, right? So this is where investing in those relationships early before the opposition develops is really critical and and so that they they found themselves sort of on the back foot and and getting further behind just because they couldn't keep up with the you know the, the growing opposition so that's when they they kind of approached us and signed up with our software getting that sort of stakeholder mapping and identification early was really um, critical. Um, and, you know, they were able to turn the situation around quite quickly by, by not only having a, you know, an accessible up-to-date list of stakeholders that the team could share, they had visibility over who was talking to them because they had people out in the field, you know, talking to um, the various ranchers and community members, businesses, they needed to be able to see who else had spoken to them, what was the you know response, take some notes, really, so that it wasn't just in people's heads or in their individual email addresses, in address box. Um, so getting that visibility, the so contact list, the visibility, really important. And then very quickly, they were able to send out information, updates to um, the relevant stakeholders to kind of clarify the situation or provide some additional factual information. And um, they saw that turn around fairly quickly as well. So a good case study that, you know, even if you do start getting opposition, it's not too late to try and kind of rectify the situation because you're still going to be in that community for a long time. You still need to build those relationships. Good point. Being proactive and uh, uh, in the early stages probably saves a lot of money and uh, reduces a lot of risk. Our next uh, situation is where a company depended on reporting structures that uh, failed them. So Alison, what was the issue here and how was it addressed? Um, so, so this is um, a, a case study that I thought were, was worth discussing. This is actually the Rio Tinto case. So this is very public information. So I'm, you know, I can and share who that is with. The challenge here was that um, a couple, two or three years ago, um, Rio Tinto, as part of the operations, ended up blowing up this mining site in Western Australia. That was a 40,000 year old indigenous site of significance. And um, the fallout from that action was enormous. You know, the CEO had to resign, um, the, um, a couple of people in the C-suite had to resign actually. And they, they actually had someone in the C-suite who was responsible for stakeholder engagement. Um, she had to resign, the share price took a dive. So quite um, quite significant kind of um, impact for the for the company as a result of it. 
And I think, you know, a lot of a lot has been written and, and said about why that happened. Um, why did those games get blown up without the company understanding the risk of um, the action? And I think if you, you know, and you're welcome to read up about it, but I think if you really drill down into the detail of it, uh, I think that it was their reporting structures that failed them. So people on the ground knew of the issue and knew the risks, and um, they had a complex matrix reporting structure. So although, you know, on the face of it, um, they did the right thing. It's not often companies will have someone in the C-suite with responsibility for stakeholder engagement. You know, that's a great standard, the significance of the risk. Um, so, you know, that that that's kind of um, a pretty catastrophic example of what can happen when, you know, you don't have the systems in place to, to report uh, across the organisation on risk. You know, since then, Rio Tinto has taken, you know, quite a few actions to try and improve it. They've employed a lot more people and they're looking at their structure. So this is not, you know, aimed to, um, you know, beat them up about it, but uh, it's a, an important kind of case study, I think, to keep in mind um, when you're designing your reporting structures and you're looking at, you know, risk management to understand stakeholder risk in all of its complexity. Great. Thanks, Alison. A very, very powerful uh, issue there about not uh, getting ahead of a or understanding an issue before it hits you. Our last uh, case study is about a situation that uh, revolved around the end of life planning for a mine. Alison, tell us about, uh, about this situation. I think this is a challenge that a lot of uh, mining companies face. You know, what do we do with the site? Um, we're, we're leaving this community. Often it's in a remote area and um, it's been the main source of employment for a long time. What do we do with those people who may not have, um, you know, easily transferable skills into other industries? Um, and then there's an enormous cost of, um, you know, environmental rehabilitation. And interesting, um, the, this case study in particular is an interesting case where um, we're working with a company who's taking a very different approach to this. So rather than going along with the idea of that we need to restore this site to its natural environment of what it was before mining, which, you know, let's face it, is a pretty impossible um, task, right? They're looking at repurposing repurposing it. So working with the community in a very proactive way to reimagine what that space could be and what other industries that could bring to it. So taking very much a community development approach. And um, yeah, it's a really different approach to um, end of life planning of the site. Uh, really, you know, I, I think that might be a case for, a, we should do a webinar on just that and bring this company along, um, Greg, because it's a huge topic. And I think it be, um, you know, they, they're doing some very innovative work with it. And we're really, yeah, we're thrilled that they're using our software to, to help enable that. Um, let's um, maybe plan another webinar to go through it in more depth. Yeah, so definitely a, an example of community consultation uh, to get people's input involved so that when they, you know, when um, the changes are made, the community is very supportive of it. Okay, thank you. So before we uh, uh, wrap up, I'm also going to have Allison talk about some best practices uh, for deploying stakeholder relationship management. Some organizations do it well, some struggle, and I'm going to talk about six or seven key things to keep in mind if you're putting um, in line with what you're hoping to achieve. Um, often we sort of launch into these processes without thinking through, um, you know, what exactly do you need to know? Who needs to know what information from this? And so really planning out, um, you know, what you're hoping to achieve out of it. And hopefully um, you've already got some sense of what the critical risks and um, are involved in this project and you can kind of address them individually as well as a whole, um, you know, some of the risks are common across all kind of mining or natural resources projects. How do we, um, how do we plan for that? So, so that's a critical step. Um, I think that, you know, is worth investing the right amount of time in it. And then I think you need to look at, um, you know, which processes and methods are going to support that 
uh, in the most effective way. So obviously you keeping in mind the resources you have to implement these processes, um, you know, what's, a, what's the most effective? And look, one of the nice things um, when you start doing this in a disciplined way is you start to be develop your own benchmarks and your own kind of ideas of which methods work best for you. Obviously methods that work in one country or regional area are not necessarily gonna work in a you know, translate easily into a different site. So I think particularly with mining companies, you've got to be quite aware of the context, you know, the, the local context uh, in which you're operating. So things like how do we capture the interactions? How do, what's our analysis processes? How do we use that data? Those kinds of things. Also just being really localized, you know, you need to look, mm. um, be aware of local timeframes, local context, cultural language, um, look at things like, um, gender inclusivity, um, they, sometimes the, the challenges, you know, in designing your structure are a little bit more complex uh, in those kind of circumstances. Okay, great. Well, not surprisingly, since we are stakeholder management software, we're pretty biased about this, but we think getting a good system system in place is going to really help you because it's going to streamline the uh, efforts. It's um, it's going to give you that visibility on what you're doing. Of course, you can still do this in, you know, spreadsheets and things like that, but it gets more complex and, and it, it, you know, adds um, an administrative burden and a level, level of risk, you know, for as long as you can, but then look, look at getting something custom designed. Also, if you have, you know, you're doing surveys now and you want to uh, leverage those tools, you're comfortable with those survey tools or other reporting tools you have, um, look for a system where you can continue to use those. Um, you don't have to throw them out, but work well with the dedicated solution that you, uh, you acquire. And then, you know, this this is one that people often forget. So um, adoption, user adoption is so critical to success. Um, we often will say to people, go with the simplest option possible. Like even in terms of what your objectives are, you may want to achieve a lot, but what's the bare minimum you need to achieve that would kind of meet most of your goals? 80% of your goals will be achieved if we got to this standard. Keep it simple, yeah? focus on the simple first and then grow outwards from there. If you try and kind of uh, implement a very complicated approach and system um, right from day one, you know, when people haven't had a system like that before, it, um, yeah, it can really fail. So focus, you know, on how you're gonna make this uh, as easy as possible for the teams on the ground, especially um, to use and um, implement. Great. and yeah, uh, uh, you know, build on it, start small, start simple and build from there. And I think focusing on reporting is really critical and make sure that you're tracking the right things. You know, that old saying of what measure gets done. Um, if you've got metrics and KPIs that you've defined right at the start, um, it'll make sure that you are on track and you are reporting on the right kinds of information. So um, we're big fans of reporting and evaluation, not just collecting information. So, um, you know, can you identify what the emerging issues are, what the sentiment is, what's the sentiment of the stakeholders are most crit critical to your success? Those are the sort of things you should track. So look at the quality of metrics you're tracking as well and, you know, how much value they're going to drive, um, d deliver for your work to, to help you know whether you're on track. Great. Thanks, Alison. I appreciate you walking through those. So let's, um, let's do a quick summary of our uh, key uh, topics that we covered today, and then we'll open it up to them historically. At the same time, um, we're seeing a great interest in stakeholder relationship management. It's becoming really a critical requirement and not just in the initial exploration permitting stages, but across all of the stages uh, within a project. Reduce risk, achieve faster completion times, deliver better outcomes, and build social uh, capital, uh, which 
helps you a lot if something does go wrong. It gives you uh, an opportunity to to mend things uh, faster than if you didn't have that social capital. Um, we talked about in-place technologies, whether it's contact management systems or Excel or uh, various Microsoft uh, uh, SharePoint uh, technologies. Um, we get called all the time by people who say, hey, I've been using this for a while and we just hate it. What can you do to help us? So um, it's really important to consider the best technology uh, that can help you get um, the meet the objectives that you're trying to achieve. Um, we talked about best practices. Uh, Allison gave you seven points. And I think uh, um, um, those are ones that you want to consider as you look to deploy a system that will greatly uh, increase the chances of achieving your, your objectives. And lastly, what I'd like to say, a, a commercial from our sponsor. Um, uh, we offer a very powerful technology called Simply Stakeholders uh, that's been used by a lot of organizations to easily and cost effectively implement stakeholder relationship management that in such a way that it maximizes their success. So now I'd like to open it up to uh, uh, Q&As for our attendees. Um, you can go to the chat screen and um, um, there's a, a button that says Q&As. Just type in a question that you have there. Uh, just starting out on this journey. What are some easy things we could do right now that would make a big difference to our stakeholder to, our, to stakeholder management? I think um, start with um, stakeholder mapping. Just identify uh, it's more than likely you've got some spreadsheets, perhaps multiple sheets across the team, uh, or maybe it's sitting in people's email um, contacts. So, yeah, you know, that's the first step. That's your foundations is identifying who your stakeholders are. Um, there's some great templates out there also, and, and some good resources on our website. Have a look at them. Um, in terms of building a stakeholder management plan. Um, I think we've got a, a really nice, easy way to create a, a stakeholder management plan. I'd start there because that will guide you through how you can structure your stakeholder list and how you can plan out your activities for it. I think it take, it'll take you about 15 or 20 minutes to set up a template plan and um, you can build from there. So definitely recommend that. Um, it, it'll be on, under the resources section on our website, simplystakeholders.com. Um, so start there, get a great plan. And the nice thing about that plan that we have is, um, you know, it, it's very, it's structured, it's strategic, and it's short. People will actually read it and use it. You know, too often these plans end up being these enormous documents that no one looks at once they're created. So start there and, you know, reach out. We're always happy to provide advice and um, share our ex expertise and knowledge with you. So get in touch via our website, we'll, we'll happily give you some guidance. Thanks, Alison. So if we didn't get to your question today, certainly send us a uh, an email to info at simply love to chat with you.